Let's continue. Back to the novel. Cardenio takes up the previously unconcluded story at exactly the same point where it was interrupted by Don Quixote. It turns out that Don Fernando found a letter by Lustinda in which she expressed her anxiety over Cardenio's absence and announced that her father seemed willing to accept her marriage. Note that this letter is hidden in the Amadis of Gaul that Cardenio had lent her. Note also that unlike Sancho, Cardenio has memorized this letter. Cardenio then confessed to Don Fernando that he feared his own father did not want him to marry Lucinda. Don Fernando offered to mediate between his friend and his father. In recounting this, Cardenio interrupts his own story to enumerate a long list of traitors from classical antiquity, chivalric novels, Spanish history, and the Bible, all comparable to Don Fernando. O oh, ambitious Marius, O oh, cruel Catiline, O oh, lawless Scylla, O oh, lying Ganelon, O oh, treacherous Bellido, O oh, vengeful Julian, O oh, greedy Judas. He then expresses his amazement at the fact that Don Fernando, a distinguished nobleman, caballero illustre, could have wanted to steal from him my only sheep and one that I did not yet possess. Then Cardenio, showing his skills as a narrator, closes his interruption, let us take up again the broken thread of my unhappy story. First, Fernando managed to send Cardenio away in order to ask his family for some money to pay for six horses, which he had arranged to buy. The night Cardenio and Lustinda said goodbye, the young man informed her that everything had been arranged with the help of Fernando. But in a melodramatic way, the girl took it badly. Her eyes welled up with tears, and a lump in her throat left her unable to speak any of the other words which I thought she was trying to say to me. The two then exchanged a hundred thousand trifles. A curious commercial term is woven into this part of their exchange. Cardenio praised the beauty of Lucinda, and she paid me back with interest. Volvíame ella el recambio. To increase the scene's melodrama and mystery, Cardenio says that before leaving, he took almost by force one of her beautiful white hands and brought it to his mouth, insofar as the narrowness of the vulgar grating that divided us would allow. Erotic and sensual, right? By way of all these love letters, intimate betrayals, and nighttime romantic encounters, Cervantes adds yet another genre to his increasing repertoire. The sentimental novel of the early 16th century, exemplified by the tragic comedy of Calixto and Melibea, or The Jail of Love. When Cardenio arrived at the home of Fernando's brother, he was ordered to wait about eight days, and he obeyed like a good servant. But on the fourth day, a man arrived with a letter from Lucinda. The man told Cardenio that a beautiful lady had called to him from a window, saying, Brother, if you are a Christian, as you seem to be, for God's sake, I beg you to get this letter straight away to the place and the person to which it is addressed. She then tossed him a handkerchief containing a hundred reales and a gold ring. The man confessed that he felt compelled to make the trip not only because of the payment, but because he already knew Cardenio, and finally, on account of the tears of that beautiful lady. So we read yet another letter from Lustinda and learn that her situation is now desperate. Her father, tempted by the advantage he thinks Fernando has over Cardenio, decided to allow the Duke's younger son to marry his daughter. At that point, Cardenio finally found out what was happening to him. Not the purchase of horses, but that of his own pleasure had made Don Fernando send me to his brother. Now Cardenio tells how he returned to his city at night, leaving the mule he was riding at the home of the messenger, and went directly to the grate at the same hour that he and his beloved would usually meet. Let's look carefully at the twisted and suggestive description that Cardenio gives us of this meeting. Lucinda knew me, and I knew her, though not as she should have known me, and I her. But who in the world can boast that he has penetrated and understood the confused thoughts and immutable nature of a woman? 
Imagine how Freud would interpret these various applications of verbs like to know and to penetrate. Finally, Lucinda was dressed in a wedding gown and the traitor Don Fernando, the greedy father and witnesses, were all waiting in the main room of her house. Lucinda's plan was to prove her love for Cardenio, avoid her marriage with arguments, razones, or else commit suicide with a hidden dagger. She begged her lover to be present in order to behold the extreme desire she had always had for him alone. Cardenio responded with what appears to be a promise. May your acts, my lady, make true your words. If you carry a dagger to validate your sincerity, here I carry a sword with which to defend you or kill myself if fate turns against us. Cardenio's language here is poetic and romantic and suggests the first step toward his current psychotic condition. Thus, the night of my sadness closed in, the sun of my happiness set. I was left without light in my eyes, without the power of reason in my understanding. In any case, he took courage and entered the house of Lucinda, which he evidently knew very well. And without being seen, he hid in the alcove of a window of the same room concealed by the minutia of two tapestries, between which I could see, without being seen, everything that occurred in the room. Wow, what a maze all of this is.